Robbie, at the request of, of State House, my name is Joe Ageo, and in this interview, I will be joined by my colleague Lina Skaikai from Royal Media Services and Eric Latte from the Standard Media Group. And it's my colleague Lina Skaikai who's going to go with the first question of this interview. Thank you, Your Excellency. The hashtag out there is Ruto must go. Doesn't need much interpretation, does it? Protesters want you out of office. How do you respond to that? Everybody is entitled to their opinion. Um, I have a job to do. We are a country of uh, rules. Uh, we are a constitutional democracy. And um, citizens, because we all enjoy the freedom of speech, freedom of thought. Uh, citizens are free to uh, engage in discourse that uh, um, they want to, uh, but that is what it is. That is, those are the fruits and signs of a democracy. But this, that, is, that this is no ordinary discourse, Mr. President. Over 20 people are dead. 39 are missing through state uh, driven abductions. And first, they're asking a very simple question. 24 people dead. Your Excellency, do you have blood on your hands? I have no blood on my hands. 19 people, to the record that I have from the security agencies, are dead. Very unfortunate. Um, as a democracy, that should not be part of our conversation. 2.4 billion of property has been destroyed. The office of the Chief Justice has been burnt. City Hall has been burnt. Parliament has been burnt. Let, that that let, is let, the let's, situation. Let's turn so lives. Let's turn lives. We have um, let's turn lives, Your nineteen let's people turn lives, dead. Your Excellency. We have nineteen people I said people twenty-four. Dead. You said 19. Let's stay on lives. And number two. Your Excellency. On abductions. Your Excellency, let's stay on lives. There are people who are burying their children, whether they're 19 or 24. <laughs> and they're watching now, and they want to see how you feel about the deaths. Give us your feelings, Your Excellency. Let me tell and, you. And we could give examples, uh, Your Excellency. There is a 12-year-old boy, Kennedy, Kennedy Onyango from Rongai, whose mother narrated how his boy was basically just going to get books for his schoolwork. There is Rex Masai, who was shot in the middle of the street in Nairobi. And these are real human beings. Don't you feel a sense of responsibility for what is going on in the country? Let me tell you the following. Any life that is lost is something that must bother anybody beginning with myself. And it is the reason why I have told you that when I came into office, I said three things. Number one, I said there will be no extrajudicial killing in Kenya. That's number one. And I have made sure that there is no extrajudicial killing in Kenya. That's number one. Number two, when I came into office, I said, I want an independent police service. And I did sign the necessary instruments so that the police does not need permission, does not need authority, and does not report to the office of the president. The, uh, the police operational, financial independence, I have made sure that the police don't have to ask me, don't ask to have, ask anybody. They operate independently. And number four, it is true that children got into situations that they were, they became victims. Of, uh, of, of the demonstrations. What started 
to all of us, and I have spoken about it. I have said, the young people who have stepped forward to engage in the political discourse of their country in a peaceful manner, tribeless, are a welcome development in Kenya. That I said. But let me also say the following. These great young people who have stepped forward to prosecute their agenda, the affairs of the country, I am certain that they did not ban parliament. Criminals and other agents who took advantage of a legitimate concern of Kenyans stepped in, went and banned the Chief Justice Office, went and banned uh, City Hall, went and banned Parliament, and destroyed property of innocent citizens. The parents, the parents, Mr. President, so what are you telling them? These things are happening un under every, your watch. I am telling under every, your watch. I am telling every parent, I have kids like they do, and I care when there are issues in town where criminals can take advantage of situations and create a situation where the police have to use rubber bullets, the police have to use live bullets in some cases, because that is what an independent police service has to do. And I am sure the police have a record and have an explanation for every incident that they were engaged in. Here is the incident, Mr. President. This boy, 12 year old, took eight bullets, eight bullets into the body of a, eight year, of a 12 year old boy. What would you tell the mother of that boy? That boy is alive, right? No, it's not. Kennedy Onyango died. He's died. So he's the one who died? Yes. So you're not talking about the, the person who was shot with rubber bullets? No. No. Yeah? Shot with bullets so, eight times. Let me, let me tell you. Yeah. In Gong, this is the situation in Gong, right? In Gong, there was an incident where the police were overpowered by criminals. They took um, a firearm from the police. They used that firearm against people. And one policeman had to shoot this fellow who had hijacked a gun from a policeman so that not to endanger the lives of more citizens. It is among the three people. One of the criminals is among the three people who was shot by the police after they overpowered the police and took the bullet and, and took the gun from the police and used it against innocent citizens. I cannot confirm to you that this is not the man that shot the child. But investigations are going on, and we will get to the bottom of it. Mr. President, I, I am telling the mother of this young person yeah. that I, as president, will make sure that finally I will give her an explanation of what really happened and make sure that we bring this to a situation where, like her, uh, like myself who have children, she too, can be, her child can be accounted for. Mr. President, the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights is the one that has accounted for 24 bodies lying in morgues. And those bodies, the records show that these people either died in hospital and while undergoing treatment for gunshot wounds, or they ended up in the morgue in the last two weeks with gunshot wounds, 24. These 24, Mr. President, are you saying that the security agencies have told you that these 24 were criminals, that these 24 were armed, they were posing a danger to the police officers, and that is what necessitated the police to use live bullets on them? Because the circumstances for the police officer to use a live bullet is clear, even in their own code of operations. It is when the life of that police officer is in danger, or when somebody else's life is clearly in danger and the person who is endangering that person is armed. Were the 24 armed? Did they 
pose a danger, a direct threat to the police? Two things. The same Kenya Human Rights Commission. Kenya National Commission. Kenya yeah. National Commission. The of, government agency. Yeah, the government agency. Yes. Told the nation that there was a massacre in Githurai and 20 people were killed in Kithurai. Were 20 people killed in Kithurai? Really? The Kenya National Commission on Human Rights does not have records of 20 people killed no, in No, but, but that's, that's their statement. It is, it is a statement that is public, you know? So the same Kenya Human Rights, uh, Kenya Commission, uh, Human Rights, National, National, Commission. Hum, uh, National Human Rights Commission told the country a blatant fake news falsehood. That yes. Are there you was saying this, a massacre this 24 in, is um, also... Let me, let me, you ask me a question. Allow me to answer. Yes. They, they to, that's what they told the country. So an organization that can tell the country without verifying that there was a massacre in Kidurai. In fact, BBC, on that account, went to investigate in Kidurai. And of course, you know, you have read, BBC has said there was no massacre in Githurai. Mr. President. There was one person who was shot by the police. Let me, yeah, let me, let yeah, me answer. Yeah. So, an organization that is as reckless as to say there was a massacre when there was none, now is telling us there are 24, the police are saying 19. We will, we will find out where the numbers are. Okay. But that is the credibility. Okay of the organization oh, okay. that you're telling. Mr. Mr. President, that, but that may let, well be. Let, let, me, let me also, you may, my, my just question, on Mr. That President, issue, the death was so that Larry can follow up. The people you who may, died, yeah, that's where I'm coming. are they a danger that, that's to the where, police? That's where I'm coming. Are they the criminals that you're talking about? Let me tell you two things. There will be an investigation on how these 19 Kenyans died. There will be a clarity, an explanation for each and every one of them. I have told you one situation where somebody accosted the police, took over the firearm, started to shoot at people, endangering the lives of many other Kenyans. He was shot by the police. There is a situation in parliament. How did the invaders in parliament? They invaded parliament and went straight for the armory at the Moselia. They went straight at the armory at the Sergeant at Arms office. Those are the investigations that we will get into and a proper explanation will be given to the country. Are Mr. weapons lost? What I am saying. Are the weapons that they, are the armories and the mausoleum and inside parliament? That, that, are they that, is why, that is why there will be an investigation Me of how these armories were attacked and were there how did these people know that there was an armory in parliament? Mr. President, you may, you may not believe the Kenya National Commission on Human Rights, but surely you would believe your own deputy who has said there's been a return to extrajudicial killings and abductions contrary to what you and him promised the people of Kenya. Let me tell you, I am the president and I speak for the government of Kenya, right? And so this is my, this is what I'm telling you. I made three commitments that I will make sure the police in, is independent. And I did that on my first day in office. Number two, I said there will be no extrajudicial killing in Kenya. I have kept my, my, my promise. Number three, I have told you that if there is any arrest by the police, that does not amount to an abduction in my very honest uh, Let's pause for a moment, uh, Mr. President, and I just want us to go to that video over there, which will play on air, and uh, let's pause and watch it together, Your Excellency. Let's watch this video. Sell them to the people of Kenya. There are enough intelligent people in Kenya to differentiate what is good from what is better and what is best. And why let their but these people don't understand the damage they are doing to the people and the economy of Kenya. All right. All right. Yeah, yes, the, the video in uh, contention here is was recorded earlier today. Yes. 
that of former MP Alfred Keter being abducted in broad daylight. Mr. President, before you even talk about the entire incident, the children were screaming, and the sound that we believe belongs to the wife was also heard, screaming in distress. How does that make you feel? Three things. I have told you, I made a deliberate decision to make sure that the police operate independently. That's number one. Number two, I have told you, if the police summon Linus Kaikai, Kai, and Linus Kaikai Kai refuses to go to the police, are the police not entitled to come and look for you? When the police come to arrest you after they have summoned you and it, you didn't show up, is that an abduction? So let's have this as a confirmation. That no, I'm just MP, asking you. Let's have this as a confirmation, Your Excellency, that Alfred Keter was summoned by police. He refused to uh, respond to the police have issued a summons. statement. I, I would suggest, instead of uh, us having a back and forth, the police have released a statement. Can you check what the police, the police have released, the statement? And you still have not answered my question. Which the was? wife and children screaming that way. I mean, how do you feel, Your, Your Excellency? I mean, my friend, every child, every mother feels the same when their parent is under attack. I mean, that is, it, that is what it is. But let me ask you, what about the children? What about the children of those who have lost their lives because of the criminality of others. Don't they feel the same? So we, we just need to be a country of the rule of law. Impunity cuts both ways. Those who respect the law must be protected by the law. Those who do not respect the law must face the full force of the law. That, that's, how it, that's how we will have a society. Here is the impression. same way, yeah. we must condemn excessive use of police powers, Here but we must equally deal firmly and decisively with criminals who put the lives of other Kenyans in danger, destroy property of hard-earned earnings. There are many people, Linus, in this, in this demonstration that have lost livelihoods, that today their children are crying. Today, their wives are in tears because they don't know how to face tomorrow. Mr. President, their you... businesses have been wiped out. Yeah. Their incomes have been destroyed. But I have just told you 2.4 billion shillings worth I, of I business you, has been destroyed. I hear you, and today, as I talk to you this evening, there are families who have tears. There are families who do not know how to face tomorrow. And, and, and I've asked you very specifically, President, how do you feel about those tears, especially I mean, it, those it, who it's, have been it, killed it's horrible. by police bullets? It is horrible. It is horrible. When you find a situation where people are grieving, whether they are grieving because their parents have been arrested or they are grieving because they are hard earned earnings of many years, money is there. I have, I have on my phone people who are saying, I borrowed money. My whole loan has been wiped out. My whole barbershop has been destroyed. My whole hardware has been looted and burnt. And they are in tears. So I must equally work with the police to protect all these citizens. And it, and it cuts both ways, uh, Linus. It cuts both ways. Using the rule of law. Absolutely. Let me take you to just step by Absolutely. step. Absolutely. The, the rule of law says. Mm -hmm. The rule of law requires the police to investigate a matter, to when they have sufficient evidence, present that to the ODPP. The director of public prosecutions takes people who are culpable to court. That's the journey in the rule of law, Mr. President. Mm -hmm. In the case of 39 people 
who have been abducted. And the abduction here, we're using it deliberately because of the manner in which the people have been arrested, like we've seen in the case of Alfred Keter. Others who've been picked up from their houses in the middle of the night. And they are held in communicado for more than 24 hours outside of what the, the rule of law says. And then they are not taken to court, so they are not charged with anything. That is outside of the rule of law. So in one instance here we are saying we are not following the rule of law. In the second instance, Mr. President, you have people who were unarmed, like in the case of Rex, who was shot in the middle of the night, unarmed, who have been shot by police and they've ended up dead. 24 of them, you say 19. That again is extrajudicial because there is no justification that has been produced to show that there was justification for the police to use the excessive force. So basically we are showing examples where the rule of law, which you promised to uphold, which you also set and said, this is what the police has been doing. And you said, Mr. President, um, as, as you took office, that the problems with the police service also are going to the top, the leadership of the police service. And you promised the people of Kenya that you're going to hold the police to account outside of the rule of law and accountability, which comes to your desk. Are you holding the police accountable for 39 people abducted, for 24 people killed, for 627 people arrested and not charged, for 431 people injured by live bullets, rubber bullets, tear gas canisters, police batons? Uh, Latif. As I have told you, we must operate within the parameters of the rule of law. And I agree with you. The police must never act outside the framework of the rule of law. They must do that which only the Constitution and the law allows them to do. And it is very clear that any operation of the police outside the parameters of the law, the police will be held to account. Whether it is uh, holding citizens beyond the stipulated time, but I must be thoroughly clear to you, when police arrest somebody, there is a constitutional timeline which they are allowed by the law to hold that person. 24 hours. That does not amount to an abduction. 24 hours. In my, in my opinion. A case in point is what has just been said here about uh, what happened earlier today. And you guys clearly said in this uh, uh, conference that it was an abduction. I mean, it, it's just clear now that it is not an abduction. This is an arrest. And the police have come forward to say this is the situation we have arrested uh, this person, and it is, it is just good for us to all of us follow the law. And, and I agree with you. The police must act within the law. But let me ask you one question uh, also, Latif. I have never, in this conversation, which is now 20 minutes in, are you guys bothered about the fact that parliament was burnt? Are you guys concerned that millions of businesses, of Kenyans, hardworking Kenyans, we, we are, yes, were, yes. were destroyed? How do you feel? But it all happened. Yeah, How do you feel? It's, How and do it you all feel? happened under your watch, Mr. President. No, but that, this, this is at the end of the day, day. This is why we are saying you sort we, keep must, us safe. we must be even. You know, we must be even. The police have a difficult job. They have to make sure the peaceful demonstrators are protected. But they also must make sure that the criminals, and, I, and when you say criminals, you know, when I said the other day criminals, many people took offense that I was calling the demonstrators uh, criminals. That's the not- Families of the dead, your that, that is not, that's, that's a lot of offense. Family of Rex. Rex was killed in a week when the protesters were very peaceful. The first week of this protest were peaceful. We saw protesters carrying 
carrying uh, flakards and water bottles. Uh, water bottles. My, my <laughs> Rex was killed on his way out of work. Yeah, let me, let me, let me. How do you feel? You. I mean, let me, let me tell you. When they hear me, you say me. criminals, I mean, are you are you telling me Rex is the one who broke, uh, who burned Parliament? But Rex died without breaking no, in. No, I'm just telling you. He died. You know, Rex, there died are, died there are criminals yeah. who infiltrated and caused mayhem. And in fact, some of the criminals are actually harmed. They actually harmed the peaceful protesters. Many of the peaceful protesters, they lost phones. They were attacked. In fact, some of the uh, peaceful protesters were attacked by criminals including a clear example of the one I have, I, have, I have explained to you, that they overpowered the police, took the gun from the police, and started shooting innocent people. So we must deal with this situation globally. M Mr. President. I feel for Rex and the mother. This should not happen to any child in Kenya, especially when they are engaged in a peaceful demonstration. Mr. President, the, the concern I've heard from the young people, because I've been speaking to a lot of them, and they said they haven't heard you. In the two statements, actually, there are more now because you have spoken in other settings, apart from the two addresses you gave. They haven't heard you address them. They haven't heard you talk to these parents. They haven't heard you acknowledge that there were people who were shot by police in circumstances that did not warrant that. Are you saying you haven't seen anything that bothers you about how police responded to these protests? I am very... And I have, and in my first statement, I clearly said that innocent lives were lost. In my second statement, I said the same. There were innocent lives lost. But also equally, as a person who is responsible, I must think about those who are suffering because they were innocent. But I'm also, I must also be concerned about those who are suffering because criminals cause them immense harm. And, and that is the balance that I need to be able to lead a country. I must protect everybody. I must protect the protesters, and I must be concerned about their lives. I must also uh, protect innocent people who become victims of criminals who take advantage of a peaceful, democratic process that goes on in our do, do you feel that you protected all those people on, uh, in the last couple of days, whether it is people who have businesses, whether it is best. parliament, whether it is the people who lost their children? I did, I did my best. If I, if I hadn't done what I did, things would have been much worse. In fact, many people ask me, Mr. President, why did you call in the army? I mean, what choice did I have? I mean, it would have been very reckless of me in the face of the kind of harm people had gone through, the 20, 19 lives that were already lost, in the face of a burning uh, chief justice office, um, parliament, and, and the rest of it. I mean, it would have been very reckless of me not to mobilize every arm of government and every arm of our security agencies to protect the country and to protect lives. You acted as Commander-in-Chief. You also acted as President, Head of Government, and the person who took the sword and promised to protect the people of Kenya. You chair the National Security Council, which brings in the head of the police, the head of the intelligence, the head of the military, and cabinet secretaries in those doc dockets. Did you have information prior to Tuesday that there was going to be infiltration of the peaceful demonstrations by the criminal elements that you've talked about more than once. And if you did, what did you do about it? We had information, and that is why we prepared in the manner in which we did. If we hadn't prepared in the manner in which we did, we would not be counting 19. We would be counting different numbers. Okay. And I am telling you that the level of mobilization by criminals was heavy. In fact, many of the peaceful protesters, many of the young people, very well-meaning young people, left the town by 10, maybe 11, because they realized, and in fact, you could hear them in their, in their, in their, in their zelo, 
they were saying, guys, we are, this, this, is, not our, this is not our group. Let, let us go. Let us leave. You could hear them. It, it was in public domain that the peaceful demonstrators all of a sudden realized that the whole thing had metamorphosed into, into criminality. So there were criminal and, elements that basically hijacked. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, it is Sunday. Mr. President, how many people are in custody on account of this? Those who you said they conducted treasonous activities, there were criminal elements, they... Um, you will see them in court tomorrow. How many people are in custody? You will see them in court tomorrow. The police know what I, I, uh, I have a, you know, a, 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 a ballpark uh, brief by the police that they have enough people. They have actually, because in Kenya nowadays, you cannot commit crime and get away with it. Those who attacked parliament are on CCTV. Those who attacked the judiciary are on CCTV. Those who attacked everywhere, those who destroyed people's shops are on CCTV. Many of them are on the run, but we will catch them. Similarly, Your Excellency. Are the funds Similarly, Your Excellency. In, in Similarly. So, so uh, to, to your question, mm. so the police are at it because if we don't deal with impunity, we, do, we will not have a country. Now, similarly, Your Excellency, you speak of them protesters being on CCTV. Not the protesters. Yeah. I'm saying the criminals who attacked parliament. Right. Now, every policeman also, without uniform, conducted an abduction. has also been captured on camera. Those who captured Shad Kiprono were captured on camera. Those who captured Alfred Keter today were captured on camera. And a number of other uh, such incidents. Similarly, so that uh, because I can hear you balancing. Yes, uh, that's correct. Yes, are we going to see action against the killer cops or were they doing what you are saying you had to do to prevent this from being bad? Any killer cop who went beyond what is provided for in the law, will action will be taken against them. But to your question, are you telling me, Linus, that a police officer becomes only a police officer when they are in uniform? No. Police officers can identify themselves even when they are in civilian. So, and, and, and when a police officer comes to you and says, this is my ID, I am police officer, you are under arrest for the following reasons, that, that, that is legitimate. You, you cannot yes, tell me that you, you know, <laughs> because they were in civilian, then it, what they did was wrong. And you know that's, that's not what they do. And that, that's not what they did to Alfred Keter or Shad Kiprono. Why are you there? You have the, we have the CCTV footage. You, it's there for, it's, I, would, I would suggest, uh, Linus, that we be fair to the police as well. Mr. Mr. And I have given you my word. Any police officer who does anything beyond the provisions of the law know the consequences. Just as any citizen who also participates in actions that are outside the law, they also know the consequences. Uh, and it is our responsibility to make sure that security agencies act in accordance with the law as as citizens, we act in accordance with the law so that we can have a law-abiding, rules-based, uh, rule of law-based country. As things stand now, Mr. President, are you satisfied with how the police handled this whole matter? I think the police have done the best they could. If there are any excesses, we have mechanisms to make sure that those excesses are dealt with. Let's wrap it this way, Your Excellency, on that topic. You have absolutely no regrets about the abductions and no regrets about the killings? Those are your words. Those are not mine. They're also your deputy's don't words. Put much, don't put words in my They're mouth. They're also your deputy's words, and it's part of your government, because it's so scary, Mr. President, mm. sitting there and telling the whole country that from this moment on, we should not believe what your deputy tells us about the state of the nation until you speak. Yet we all thought you know, that you're part of the uh, same government. Uh, don't, don't, don't inject my deputy into this conversation. I think it is not fair, since he's not here, to tell you in what context he said whatever he said. I think it is, it is not proper 
to discuss the deputy president here, and he's my deputy. Please let me deal. But have you asked him me, that you had a press with, conference? Let me deal with the issues as they are now. I think uh, being personal and, and going that direction does not help. I, I wish this was personal, Mr. President, but it's a really serious national issue that right after you spoke, your deputy told the whole world that he was informing us that extrajudicial killings and abductions had returned to this government that he's part of. How surely can that be personal, Mr. President? I am, I am sure that uh, if you interview the deputy president, he will answer that appropriately. You haven't you asked him? It, you can take it from me that extrajudicial killing will not be part of an administration that I run. I can say that without fear now, any contradiction. Uh, Yes, in the interest of moving this conversation forward, Your Excellency, I want us to look into the last two extraordinary weeks that this country has had. Protests that you called tribeless and some of your uh, aides call leaderless. But protests that are led by young people who are unhappy with how you've run this country for the last uh, just under two years, two, two years now. But the question they have as you, they look at you and watch as you speak today, Your Excellency, do you get it? I get it. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, uh, my good uh, friend Linus. What we are facing today is not a product of two years. What we are facing today is a product of many years. We've had a problem, a youth bulge, a demographic challenge as a nation, which we have ignored for very long. For the first time, I have decided that I am going to be deliberate, I am going to be intentional on tackling the challenge of young people and unemployment in Kenya. First time there is an administration that thinks about the young people. Let me give you three examples, maybe four. Well, let's keep it within the two weeks, please. No, no, it's yeah. okay. No, it's yeah. the two weeks. Yes. You know, but you know, don't look at the two weeks in isolation. The young people we have in the street did not happen in the last two weeks. They were not born when I became president. They were not jobless when I became, they, were not, they, they did not become jobless when I became president. But I want us these, to... These are young people who over the years, we have thousand, we have close to four and a half million young people who are out of school, out of college, with degrees, certificates, diplomas, without jobs. And that is why I have done four things. Number one, when I pushed the housing program, it was not about the houses. It was about the jobs. Today, as I talk to you, Linus, we have 160,000 young people working in different parts of Kenya under our housing program. In Mukuru, here in Nairobi, and I challenge you, Linus, to go there tomorrow, there are close to 4,000 young people working who are jobless. Number two, I have a whole program on digital jobs. I was in I was in Ruru now yes, with the MP for so, with and just allow me allow me to interrupt no, you no allow because me there are there are risks on both ends of this interview no I'm, I'm just I'm, you told me it. you told I want me us, I want about Your Excellency the young to people talk about the last two weeks and the young people are saying you don't get it you don't understand what they are talking about mm -hmm. now what is the trigger here they're saying there was this conversation about the finance bill that your government until the other day, could not listen to anybody. It's not about the housing project, it's about listening. They are saying, yours is not a listening presidency, and yours is not a listening government. How, how best can I listen to the young people of Kenya if I am not addressing their issues? And that is why I want to tell you, Linus, these young people, what is their biggest issue? They have talents. They have gone to school. They have no jobs. That is the problem. And I am addressing those, those issues. Housing is one of them. Digital jobs is another. 
I was in Ruiru with Simon Kingara, the MP for Ruiru, launching a, a, an ICT hub that will hire, is actually hiring already for 5,000 young people. Our whole plan, including what was in the finance bill, was to increase CDF by 10 billion shillings to roll out ICT hubs in every ward in the Republic of Kenya. So that they, we can so hire President. young people, train them, put them on digital jobs. I have a third program then the on export of labor. Mr. President. I have a fourth program longer. on manufacturing yes. to be able to create more opportunities for the young people of our country. And, and we want to inform you, they're no longer just talking about things that can be done to them as a demographic. They are looking at the big picture. Finance bill brought them out. And when did they come in? They came in after all public participation forums were not listened to. Kenya Association of Manufacturers spoke to the parliamentary committee, same thing, and said this is a bad bill. In Association of Insurance spoke to the, the, the parliamentary team, this is a bad bill. Mm. We had a big conversation on national television, mm. this is a bad bill. Mm. You did not listen. Mm. You had a meeting here with your UDA MPs and at some point told them to pass it as it is. And until the last week, that was the first Tuesday when the protests were there, when now you offered, um, you offered to uh, s some amendments. They're saying you're just not listening, and it's not about them. It's about the big picture issues, and we'll come to them, including the question of corruption, which is not really a youth thing. <coughs> Indeed, Mr. And just to add on to, just to, add on to that, you Mr. President, respectfully, have been more Mr. President, just, I just want to come in. In your analysis. I just want to add on to that, Mr. Because, yeah. I want to add on to because, that. let me, let me just finish it. It's the same question. It's okay. the same question. Mr. President, if you went into all the tweet, the X spaces, where the youth are speaking, if you looked at the demonstrations and what they were saying, the placards they are carrying, None of them has talked about we don't have jobs. None of them have talked about the housing jobs are not enough for us. None of them have talked anything about what you've mentioned. So it's not that they are not seeing about the jobs. It is beyond that, Mr. President, and respectfully I want to put it to you that you're not hearing what they're saying. The fact is, we only had after the protests, after all those things you described, that's the time that you let came me, and let said, me, I let have me, listened. Let me, let me tell you the following. The rejection of the finance bill, and this goes to what uh, Linus has said, that um, we didn't hear anything. Let me tell you, the process of a finance bill, in fact, you know, many people believe in Kenya that the finance bill is an invention of William Ruto. It is not an invention of William Ruto. The finance bill is an instrument that has been with us ever since independence. Only that we have made it much more transparent only that we have brought out more to the public. And that is why there is greater interrogation of what government is doing, especially after the new constitution that made public participation, not a, 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 a sterile provision of the constitution, but public participation to be an integral part of lawmaking, an integral part of managing the country. Let me tell you, when we took the bill, when, when, it, when we uh, formulated the bill, it had 346 billion of new revenue. When MPs went out to the public, the public said, we don't think this is good. We don't think this is good. It was reduced by 140 something billion shillings. It remained just 200 billion. Doesn't that amount to listening? No, it doesn't. That, that the public said, reduce this by... No, it uh, doesn't, no. Mr. President. And that's yeah. why I okay. said reject it. Just it wait. Tells you just wait. That no, no, we are talking about listening. Yeah. Let, just relax. We're talking about listening, okay? So the public said, reduce this by 146. We sat down, we cut down the areas, we reduced it to uh, 200. What went into the space was... The people who wanted to mislead the public, to say, oh, you see, in fact, uh, everything you have been told is still there. This was not removed. These people are not listening. These people are not listening. And let me tell you, 
my good friend uh, Latif. We have dropped the finance bill. Yeah? What does that mean? It means we have gone back almost two years. It means that this year we are going to borrow a trillion shillings to be able to run our government. That's what it means. I have been working very hard to pull Kenya out of a debt trap. Mr. President. Let, let, no, let me, just allow me. Because you know, we need to contextualize this finance bill. It is easy, uh, Joe. It is easy for us as a country to say, let us reject the finance bill. That's fine. And I have graciously said, we will, we will drop the finance bill. But it has huge consequences. It means we will not confirm the JSS teachers, 46,000 of them. It means we cannot support our farmers with two billion shillings for us to make sure that farmers get a fair return of 50 shillings per kilogram, uh, per, per kilo of their milk. It means we cannot sort out the coffee debts. It means we cannot support the cherry fund. It means we cannot sort out the um, uh, debts of farmers in, in, uh, in, in, in Mumias. It also means that we will continue to import potatoes from Europe when we have potatoes in his village. You just told me you're in Kimana. Mr. We have potatoes Mr. in Mr. Yandaro. President, we have, we have onions all over the place. That may well be. I think the problem has been these are people who are saying they haven't been listened to. You only listen because you said on that night, on that Wednesday night, that is the moment you said that you had realized, Mr. President, that Kenyans did not want anything to do with that bill. And one would wonder, how can that be, Mr. President? And, and you have had all these presentations that have been made. Did it have to take demonstrations and sadly loss of lives for you to come to a point where you'd realize what your people, the people that voted for you, are saying that I think is what the young people are asking. Let me tell you, uh, Joe. Members of parliament are representatives of the people, elected. They are not fools and they are not mad. And I want to say one day Kenya will know that the MPs who voted yes are the true heroes of Kenya. Those are the people who saw the opportunity for us to unchain our country from debt trap and take our country to the future. Let me tell you, Joe, and I want to say this to the people of Kenya, that my plan was to make sure that in the next three years, maximum four years, we have a balanced budget where Kenya is not the country where we are today. Let me uh, tell you, gentlemen, and I want to tell the people of Kenya the following. We are in a very difficult financial position. This is something that the people of Kenya must understand, and that is why I am happy that we have a crisis. This crisis will help us be candid and speak to each, uh, to each other properly and contextualize where we are. We raised this year 2.3 trillion from our taxes. Of that, 2.3 trillion, 1.1 trillion went to debt financing. 1 trillion went to salaries. What did we do? We had to go and borrow to pay the counties. We had to go and borrow to fund our education. We had to go and borrow to fund now. The, the funding gap we have done with the finance bill going down is that instead of borrowing 600 billion, we are going to borrow 600 billion plus 346 billion, that is close to a trillion. And let me tell you, uh, my good friends, and I want us to be honest with ourselves, this is not how a country will get to a status where we are proud of our nation. This is not how we are going to, this is not how we are going to grow. Uh, and that is why, and that is why, mm. Linus, 
this situation, this crisis is a very important inflection point that we can sit yeah. together, assess, let us agree. And I have, I have no problem. Let us agree. Yeah. Do we continue borrowing? Uh, let me give you the statistics. Uh, when in 2013, Linus, just allow me one minute, please, with a lot of respect. Okay. In 2013, the debt stock of Kenya was 1.8 trillion. For 10 years, that increased five times to 11 trillion, 10 point something trillion. We built a lot of roads. We connected a lot of electricity. We did many things in 10 years, but we were doing it on debt. Today, we don't have the luxury to borrow because we have reached the limit. And today, yeah, I, let me finish. Okay. Today, all the money we borrowed from 2013 is maturing. That is why the biggest challenge that we have as a nation is that we are spending 1.1 trillion every year of taxes we collect from ordinary Kenyans to pay debt and not the whole debt. That's interest. interest. Alone. Yeah. Interest you know? principal comes to 1.8 trillion this year. So, my good friends, and yet you want to tell me, William Ruto, don't collect domestic taxes. Go borrow more money. No, that, Mr. That's, President. That's not what they're saying, uh, that, uh, President. Uh, what, just, what, that, what, is, what is the alternative? Yeah, yeah, and I just wanted to come to one no, what, thing. Is, what is the alternative? Just, yeah. just help me there. Yeah. Because there are, there are only two things you can do. Either you raise money from taxes or you borrow, period. Yes. There, 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 there is no magic there, here. There are Kenyans, Your Excellency, right now who do not listen to all that. Yes. They are not interested in that. That's okay, but, but that's the reality. Then, but, but I need if, you are not in, if, I did, if you do not want to listen uh, to hang reality... On your hang, on, hang on, Your Excellency, because I need you to address a very important issue here. And that is one of a trust deficit. There are Kenyans who watch you, Your Excellency, and I don't know whether you are aware that they don't trust what you say. They don't believe what you say. Are you aware, Your Excellency, for example, that a lot of Kenyans increasingly don't associate the truth with you? That is your assessment because you have never associated the truth with me <laughs> from the beginning. No, no, there's, the there's quite a number of no, Kenyans. No, I mean, that well, is, well, that is, that is, that is we, we, asked, we asked people before we came that here. That is your assessment. Yeah. And many of those that responded to me directly mm. and to even our platforms on KTN News, on Spice FM, on NTV, on Citizen, and we were asking them, what question should we ask the president this evening? And the one thing that many of them were saying is, when will he stop lying? So it's not Linus. That can he tell us the truth this time? Let me, yeah. let me say the following. I told the people of Kenya that I would reduce the prices of fertilizer from 7,000 to 2,500. I don't know how that is a lie, because they buy it at 2,500. Okay. You, you, I told the are, I, I told the people of Kenya we are going to have we're going to have a housing pro program. A housing program is underway in Kenya. I I can tell you, Linus, that whether you believe me or not, facts will not change. Yeah, and facts I, are not changed by who says it. And, and, and allow facts me to and allow me to facts. step back a bit, Your Excellency. And facts yeah. are very yes. stubborn. Allow me to step back a bit. Yes. And what I'll do is we'll play clips, just a little combination of clips of yourself speaking not too long ago, and I want us to listen to that. I'll stand out of the way because you said it's, it, it's me that doesn't share the truth with you. And I would like you to respond to yourself, to the clips that we are going to uh, play. But, but if, you see, uh, you see uh, Linus. Let, let's watch that, Your Excellency. Uh, I think Linus. Yeah. You, uh, you, you don't bring clips that are in a biased way. You know, you select maybe uh, something that has not happened. No. Can, can you be fair and select clips across the board what I said and has been done and what I said and maybe has not been done? Are there so, things so let's watch that. Yeah. Let's, maybe you can watch that. And why let their but these people don't understand the damage they are doing to the people and the economy of Kenya. 
kwa hii taxes wanaongeza usiku na mchana na mimi nataka niwaulize watu wa hapa manga tafadhali mkiona tumesimama hapa mbele yenu tunawaambia kwamba tutengeneze hiyo serikali inakuja ambayo inaelewa lugha ya mwananchi wa kawaida if you have good ideas why do you need the police why do you need blackmail why do you need intimidation if you have better ideas sell them to the people of Kenya there are enough intelligent people in Kenya to differentiate what is good from what is better and what is best ni jambo mbaya sana kama tutatumia askari polisi kuumiza wananchi wasio na hatia eti kwa sababu wako na maoni tofauti ya kisiasa anwaeleza kwa I, I agree with that. It is, it is not fair to use the police to harass citizens who have a contrary opinion. And, and, and that is perfect. That's what they're accusing I still, you of I still doing believe now. that. That's what they're but, accusing but, you but, of now. So, but, but you, you don't Alfred, tell me Alfred that... Alfred Keter. Uh, 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 what, what is the problem with Alfred Keter? Yeah. Alfred Keter, contrary opinion. No, it's not a contrary opinion. I mean, the police have said why they arrested him. It is not because of me. I didn't give any instructions. I didn't even know what, what was going on. Let me tell you, uh, Linus, I am a very clear-minded person on what I say. When it is the police, I have said many of the people who opposed me, many of the people who uh, were very scared about what I would do when I become president, even the, the people who did worse things against me, I have never gone after them because I don't believe in settling political scores using the power of state or using the police. Let me also say the following. When I talked about uh, uh, the taxes that, that uh, I was- I In was the campaign trail, yes. I, I, was, I was addressing in, in the campaign trail. It was very obvious that when, at that time, we were in subsidies. That did not make sense. It is because I removed the subsidies and I changed and put production support. That is why today the price of unga has come down from 240 to 100 because I changed the model. I changed the, the configuration and it is giving us results. But are you aware, Mr. President, that the thing perhaps apart from now the police brutality that people associate you the most is the issue of taxes. I'm sure you know the name they call you. You've actually <laughs> talked about it even yourself. This you know, guy that uh, they want to come down. Let me, let me tell you, um, uh, my good brother, Ageo. Uh, okay, Ageo. When I came into office and I assessed the situation and it was no longer possible for us to borrow money, I had to be honest with the people of Kenya. I had to, to tell them we have two options, right? And even as we imposed taxes, we explained, we made sure that there was adequate, elaborate public participation on what it is that we were trying uh, to achieve. And let me tell you uh, the following. I have done the best that I could globally. Today, our country has tremendous respect from many quarters globally because of what I have done. I have raised the profile of our country. Today, I was in uh, uh, Narok, and the tourism numbers in 2022, one, one million tourists. In 2023, uh, uh, last year, two million tourists. This year, by God's grace, we will get to 2.7 uh, million tourists because of the profile that I have done for the country. I know somebody will say that, uh, that, is, that, that, that there is no truth in that. But call the tourism sector. They will tell you themselves that all hotels in Kenya today are operating 80% upwards, which is a new phenomenon in Kenya. I will also tell you that the international community have developed enormous confidence in Kenya. I see people who are saying, why did William Ruta go to China? Why did William Ruto go to Europe? Why did William Ruto go to America? Let me just tell you uh, the following. When I went to China, we got money to be able to, uh, put, uh, to put equipment in 70 of our 
technical training colleges. Today, the contract has been signed, the equipment has been manufactured. When I went to China, we got money to build Boston Dam in, that has been waiting, that will serve the counties of uh, Bomet and Kericho. When I went to China, we got money to build, uh, we got 30 billion shillings to build roads in uh, Nyandarwa, in Kirinyaga, in uh, eight other constituencies in Kenya. That's why I went to China. When I went to America, we got a $1 billion facility to be built in, uh, in, uh, in, in, in Naivasha that is going to be the biggest data center in Africa, funded by UAE, working with Microsoft and Kenya. When I went to the US, we also agreed Kenya became the only country in Africa that is going to benefit from the CHIPS Act where we will be manufacturing computer chips with other countries. Kenya will be among the first, will be actually the only country in Africa that will benefit from that. And so, so it does many of the young people who I see today, those are my targets for the future. So it doesn't bother Can you I? that there's this tag on your head as a president who has overtaxed Kenyans and that the sufferings that we are going through is because of excessive taxation that you have imposed on Kenyans. That is what I was asking about. You see, if I am called Zakayo, yeah, because I have explained to the people of Kenya that the option we have is if we continue borrowing, we will go down the cliff. If that is what is going to take Kenya to be saved from a debt default, I don't mind being called Sakaya, because it is a sacrifice worth making. Mr. President, every morning on Spice FM, we have four hours of a talk show. Mm. And many times we ask people, even those who come to the show, to tell us what is it that the nation is saying when we are seeing people out on the streets. And many of them, even when we said that we're coming, you have invited us to come and have this conversation this evening, they said, tell the president that he's tone deaf. And we ask why and how. And they say, when William Ruto took over as president, he took over a budget of 3.2 trillion shillings. He went to parliament and he said, honorable speakers, I believe that this budget is too high. We should cut it by 300 billion shillings. So you believed barely one and a half years ago that you can run the country with 2.9 billion shillings, trillion shillings. Barely a few months, you went to Parliament and requested to spend 3.6 trillion shillings. This year, you went to Parliament and initially requested to spend 4.2 trillion shillings. And what do they see in return? They see extravagance in government. They see a government that is pushing gung-ho to employ new people called CASs. They see a government that is purchasing new motor vehicles and trips that are extravagant. They see opulence with those that are close to the president appearing in public carrying wads of cash. They see condescending attitude from those who serve in this government when they're asked, why are you spending? And they respond the way they respond. Your advisors speaking the same. And so they see a government where the president is telling people, we are going to live within our means. We are all going to tighten our belts. We have austerity. They end up with their children not going to school because for months, JS teachers are on strike. They end up with, right now, 91 days where clinical officers have not been to work. <clears throat> 91 days, Mr. President. We ended up with intern doctors going on strike for weeks because the government says it has no money. We end up with people going to the hospitals and there's no medicine. We end up with people who are being told that we don't have money to pay salaries or we don't have money to pay salaries and also uh, have a development. Yet, they see all this extravagance and opulence from those in power. You are tone deaf, Mr. President, that's what they say. Well, I guess that's why we must have a conversation. That's why we must have a conversation. 
And I'm very happy for us to have this conversation so that we can put the facts on the table and we can all of us make a decision. But let me tell you the following. I've listened to you and um, let me also tell you that today the universities which were almost closed, they had debts of 60 billion shillings. I have enhanced their budget by 40 billion shillings, the universities, because education to me is very important. It is the greatest equalizer. Today, the universities can confirm to you, and I was sitting here with the vice chancellors, that I made the right decision because we are funding the universities better. Let me also tell you, I took the decision to hire additional teachers, 56,000. It has never happened in the history of Kenya. Why? Because education is the greatest equalizer. Many parents in rural, in rural Kenya take their children to schools that have no teacher. And we are disadvantaging them. The children of the poor get the worst form of education. They have no chance. I decided, because I said it is bottom up, I decided that I'm going to put more money in making sure the child of every Kenyan has an opportunity to be their best by giving them the correct education. I decided that I am going to put money in farming. I put the first year, I put 10 billion shillings in fertilizer subsidy, a program that had been scrapped for five years. The, the, the difference is obvious. Today, by God's grace, we have a harvest. The prices of food commodities has come down. Day before yesterday, Latif, there was a release of where we are with inflation. Inflation in Kenya is now 4.6%. When I came into office, it was 9%. Inflation coming from food products. It was reported not by me, by the institutions that are charged, 4.6%. We have, the, 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 where I have invested money, <coughs> I can account for it. Right. And it is making a difference right. in the lives Their of many. Their concern is Kenyans. on extravagance yes. in government. I, I, will come, I will come to opulence in on, on, on opulence and extravagance. Every trip I have made, I have not made any trip outside Kenya to go and do things that, have of, that are of no benefit to this nation. I can account for every trip that I have made outside our nation, whether it is on projects or programs or investments or even the profiling of this country to put it in, the, in good standing for us to attract investment. In fact, the Nairobi Stock Exchange, which was, which was almost closed, was rated the best in the world, not said by William Ruto, but it was in the public domain by Bloomberg. If you don't believe me, believe Bloomberg. But Mr. President, yeah. so, so th this I, have, I have done what I could for the country. You have but let me finish you have not opulence. Questions. Let me go to the opulence. And let me be very clear that uh, the display of uh, you know, insensitivity is, is a statement that has come to me and is a sentiment that has, uh, has, has come to me. And you will see something very different going into the future. Whether it is coming from uh, my staff, whether it is coming from uh, this office. And, and I know people have raised issues of CAS, for example. I deliberately, even after parliament had approved the, the position of CAS, I have not appointed any CAS because I realized that we were in a situation that we could not, and no CAS will be appointed until we have an economy that can support more opportunities. 
I know citizens have said that there is no need for the office of the uh, first lady second or second lady, lady. Third lady. These are offices that were there. But because we have to live within our means, those offices from tomorrow, this new budget which is starting tomorrow, they will not be part of our equation because in the face of what has happened, we have to trim down every other area. And in fact, not just those, many other spaces are going to be trimmed down to reflect the new reality, especially after the finance bill was taken down uh, by myself when I said we, we take this down. We are going to cut our clothes. We are going to cut our, 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 our coat, our, our coat uh, the size of our clothes. We're going to uh, reduce uh, money going to counties. We're going to reduce money going to the judiciary. When I came into office, the judiciary was getting 18 billion. Today, they are getting 25 billion. But it was because I believed in the rule of law. I believed that we needed to do something about making sure that our judiciary has resources because Kenyans were telling me directly Justice delayed is justice denied. Will you I have the size hired of your government? the highest number of judges under my administration because I believe that Kenyans must deserve justice. Will you reduce the number of ministers, ministries, or state departments, or advisors? That is an area we are going to target and cut down because it is the reality we have to face. Mr. President, uh, when things like this happen elsewhere, this is a whole finance bill that's been taken down. Correct. You have people who have been advising you on financial matters. You have people who have been advising you on political matters, listening to the people. You have advisors who have talked down at Kenyans, who have called them spoiled kids, KFC, Java, and whatnot. And you have people who have been around you talking into your ear with regard to some of these things. And many people have ventured to actually say that this amounted to a vote of no confidence. Is there going to be some kind of shakeup that actually acknowledges that this is not where we should have been and therefore uh, I am sorry Kenyans and this is what I'm doing about it because short of that, how are we to know that we will not find more of the same? Watch this space. There are those who have said now that clearly there are many people who have lost confidence in Parliament. There are those who have lost confidence in you, that maybe the way to regain the legitimacy is to go to an election. There is no provision. You know, we are a country of the rule of law. Yeah? We must, whatever it is that we do, we must keep it within the parameters of the rule of law. And uh, we cannot take what has happened over the last two weeks or, or thereabout and say we are going to abrogate our constitution. I, I think we will be going towards anarchy. And I don't think that is where we want to take our country. There is a demand on me as president and I have said because of where we are, because of what has happened, there is going to be a thorough cut down on many things, whether we are talking about allowances, maybe even we should have a conversation around salary. We had a meeting here with MPs and even them, they are persuaded, maybe it is time to ban Harambe's so that uh, we, 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 we remove avenues of uh, people participating in uh, Laji's demonstration of, you know, uh, opulence. And I want to tell you that I am going to take action. I am going to work on this. I know what we should do, but I am also not going to be reckless and take the country into a crisis. I will make sure that I act responsibly and listening to what the people of Kenya are saying. I don't know if this will preempt you, Your Excellency, but 
one of the m most serious concerns that have been coming out, including in the Gen Z demonstrations, is the question of corruption. And uh, right through this interview, you've not mentioned the word. Um, and even as you go into that, I want to give you two illustrations. Kenyans dealt with or, or, or encountered the problem of fake fertilizers. And you never took action against your cabinet secretary for agriculture. Before that, we had the scandal around the importation of edible oil, which, Your Excellency, we don't know where the edible oil is to date. I don't think it ever found itself to the market. Again, there is a cabinet secretary uh, uh, in that ministry. And also, what got into the market was uh, condemned sugar. And when we look at all the information around these three cases, these are people close to you. They're cabinet secretaries. And so you are unable to take action against them. So why should you be trusted now to act? Because there are those who read and say you are really a hostage of those who campaigned for you to become president. They get away with anything. Three things, Linus. Um, we hadn't reached the question of corruption. So don't unfairly accuse me that I have not spoken to it. I am ready to speak about it. So that's not number one. Number two, I fired the CEO of KEPS when the uh, 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 sugar thing came up. Number two, on fake fertilizer, the minister, Mithika Linturi, was taken through a process in parliament. The CEO of National Cereals Board, the general manager of National Cereals Board, and other seven members of staff are in court, as I talked to you. The people who signed the contract, you, they are in court. You spare big fish and roast the small fish? No, uh, let, me, let me just finish. Yeah. Because I need... Uh, Linus, you know, I, I, am, I am a fair person and I am a believer in the rule of law. Even though I may not like you, but I must respect that there is a due process. The moment, you know, uh, we will have a minister who is charged in court, meaning there is evidence that they have participated in crime. Believe you me, I will take the action that is necessary. But if somebody is taken through a process and that process comes out without uh, an, in, uh, an indictment, I mean, surely we must, we must give somebody the benefit of doubt until it is proven. But and the fact that yeah. the CEO, general manager, and all the people that were there who's, who actually evidence was found have been arraigned in court. Isn't that a step in the right direction? What a political let responsibility. Me, yeah. What a political let responsibility. Me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me finish. And then number three, the other one you asked me was edible oil. The people who are involved in edible oil, I fired them and they are in court. We have a new management in Kenya National uh, Trading Corporation. In fact, we've just hired a new management for the Kenya National Trading Corporation. So th those are actions that I have taken. Can I and for your information. Vo void of what Joe is calling political responsibility. Yeah. I mean, I mean but, but you see, else in the but, ministry but, can but, be. But you see, yes. but you see uh, gentlemen, if there is no evidence against a, a minister, surely. Do you, do you want me to fire somebody if there is no evidence? You know? There was a time. Uh, Uhuru Kenyatta, as I served him as his deputy, removed six cabinet secretaries. But eventually, they were found that they were innocent, and we had to appoint them to be ambassadors. You know, so, so some of these 
you know, actions must be tampered with process yeah. of law, you know, due process. So Unless we follow due process, uh, gentlemen, we will, we, will, we, will, we will end up being something else. Allow me up to, to this, give, just a moment, just a moment, a moment an Eric, in, in a moment. Yeah. Because up to this point, Your Excellency, mm. uh, if I don't want us to lose the context, the last two weeks have been extraordinary. We've never seen anything like this. You have KDF uh, uh, troops um, in the streets of Nairobi. Up to this point, uh, Your Excellency, and including on the question that I've just asked you of accountability within your government, do you think you are addressing the grievances that have made thousands of Kenyans across the country in places that were unimaginable to get out to the streets to say Ruto must go? Do you think up to this point they feel you've addressed their grievances? Mm, I am not in their space, so uh, I, I am doing what I believe I should be doing. I have taken the responsibility to withdraw the uh, finance bill with all the attendant consequences that I have done. I know what it means, and I know where it takes the country, and it is not a simple decision for me to make. And for your information, the finance bill was going to take Kenya big steps forward. But it's a sacrifice I've had to make because of the political reality that we are in. Yeah. But it will mean counties will have to take maybe 30 billion shillings yeah. off their budget. Yeah. It means we have to reduce CDF by 10, uh, maybe 10 billion shillings. It means we have to rethink about what to do with JSS teachers. Yeah. It means we have to put on the freezer. We wanted to hire another 20,000 teachers because they are kids who do not have, uh, who do not, who do, who do not have teachers. It means we have to work on our UHC program. Uh, we, we thought we would upgrade, uh, for example, Linda Mama. Yeah. You know, we but thought we would upgrade Linda Mama. It's something you uh, oh. It means we have to hold yes. that. You, 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 and it means many things. Just told them what else they want to hear. You, you, you are speaking outward. Mm -hmm. But looking at the grievances, they are also asking questions inward uh, from you, Your, uh, uh, your Excellency. And uh, what I can hear from these grievances that have been expressed quite loudly, you said you are not in their spaces. Uh, we sometimes get into the spaces to listen to what they are saying. And all they're saying is, you cannot be, for the next three years, the president that you've been for the last two. So what is that that you're going to change about? That, that, that's, why, William that, that, that's why, uh, Linus, yes. that's why, Linus, that's why we are here. Of course, it's not going to be business as usual with the kind of reality we are faced with now. It has to be different. Do, do you regret anything at all? What you should have done better? What your people would have done better? Well, maybe there are things we should have done better. We should have communicated better. I think the biggest problem we have, even with the finance bill, because the finance bill has great things for Kenya. The finance bill says we shouldn't be importing potatoes from Europe. The finance bill says we shouldn't be importing onions or eggs from Europe. The finance bill says we should be growing our own industries. We should be manufacturing diapers in Kenya. We have 10 companies doing that. We should be manufacturing all those things in Kenya. We should be expanding our manufacturing capacity. That is what finance bill was talking to. But I am sure we will recover that when we, when, when we have explained. Yeah. The biggest challenge that I regret is that we didn't communicate better. Maybe we, we failed in explaining to Kenyans what the finance bill was all about. Because I promise you, if I explain, if I am given a chance to explain to the people of Kenya what was in the finance bill and what the finance bill would have done for this country, every Kenyan would have agreed with me. But, but, it's, but it's just, my regret yeah, would, is that they would we didn't you were, you, were, you were here, Mr. President. They said you would have explained. We didn't, we didn't explain ourselves uh, better. Maybe my communication team failed. 
maybe my, uh, not maybe, I'm sure my communication team uh, failed. Our communication uh, architecture did not deliver, did not get uh, the message out to the people of Kenya. Yep. In fact, if you look at what people were saying, they were saying, for example, there is a matter of land on the finance bill. There was no matter of land in the finance bill, not even a single line. Mm. And it is on that basis that people rejected the finance bill and many other things that were not in the finance bill. Now, communication is about words, uh, uh, Mr. President. Let's go to the deeds, because when you see what Gen Zs are doing, for the first time in the history of this country, we've had protests on the altar of the Holy Family Basilica. Because the young people of this country are telling you the political culture uh, which you've been part of, of having politicians speak in church, uh, converting the platforms into, uh, uh, con con converting the pulpit into campaign platforms must end. So I'm not hearing you addressing and looking more inward uh, into this whole picture that the Gen Z is, is painting. They're not just talking about uh, some of those things that you're raising. On that, Linus, I have even had an occasion to speak to church leaders here. On that, on matters of politics on the pulpit, I am 100% aligned. We shouldn't be using pulpits in churches or in, uh, or in any other places of worship to uh, prosecute politics. It is not right. And, and I agree, we need to change that culture. We need to change the culture of Harambe. Harambe started as a noble uh, exercise. It, it supported many people to go to school. It supported many people to uh, deal with the challenges of, uh, of medication and hospital bills. But I think it has been stretched. It bred corruption? It has, it has stretched too far. And I think it's, it's time, corruption. as a country, we must stop corruption, we, we must stop uh, Harambe's yeah. because it is, it, it is occasioning and it is uh, um, breeding, if I may say, corruption. Yeah, because when your aid of a much lower pay, uh, pay grade donates 20 million shillings to a church fundraiser, there is something fundamentally wrong. And that is why this conversation is necessary so that we can stop it. Conversation, Mr. President. On Thursday, on Wednesday, you said you are hearing that there is uh, what the Gen Zs are saying, and you're going to initiate a conversation. We saw the head of public service release a press release saying that there is now a formation of the National Multi-Sectoral Forum that will bring together all people. And you started having conversation with church leaders. The Gen Z upon seeing this, are saying, we did not ask for a conversation. We asked for action. So what action is going to precede this conversation? Because the conversation is another talk. It reminds people of the NADCO talks, the BBI talks, IPPG, IPPG talks, talks NADCO. that just happen and they just don't end. <laughs> And people are but, saying, we want action, Mr. President, but, right but now. I, okay. I, we will participate in action, in conversations maybe later. But for now, I, I, for I, now, Mr. President, yes. what's the action? I promised that I will engage the young people. Yeah, I promised. I was just making good my promise. And, and as to, and I even, I, I, I promised a, a multi-sectoral forum, and, I, and that's what I have put out. I also promised that these are some of the topics I want us to discuss. I want us to discuss debt. I want us to discuss taxation. I want us to discuss unemployment. I want us to discuss corruption. I want us to discuss these issues. And it was a suggestion, and I am open. I am, I am hearing that the young people are saying, we don't want uh, a multi-sectoral forum. Maybe we should have an engagement with the president on X. And I am open to having an engagement with the young people on a forum that they are comfortable with. You're if they want, digital? If they, if, they, if they want me to engage with them on X, X. I will be there. At, at this point, Mr. President, do you think you know what the young people want? I have many young people in my house. 
Are they telling you the all same, is well? The same ones that uh, are, uh, are in all these other spaces. And they want an engagement. They have ideas. They have suggestions. And I am open. If what we are doing on the digital space, on the housing program, on the export of labor, on manufacturing, if they have suggestions, I am open to those suggestions. They can improve, they can change, they can make new suggestions. And I also have a responsibility as a father, you know, because these are our children. I have also a responsibility to guide and to listen to them and to tell them, yes, on this, I agree. For example, on let's not have a spouse's office. I agree. Let's not have CSS, CSS for now. I agree. Let us not have advisors. Ad, uh, advisors. We will agree. Let us not have um, uh, the churches being a space for, 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 for politics. I agree. So many of these areas, we need to even have a conversation. If we are paying 46% of our revenues for salaries and wages, when the legally uh, established uh, space should be 35%, that is why I started a conversation with Salaries and Remuneration Commission. We must deal with the issue of wages and salaries so that we bring them down to 35% and leave more money for our development. That is a conversation I am very happy about. When? Mr. President, it's been two weeks. It's been two weeks of you I, saying I, every day we are we, going to we, have a conversation. We, we just, we just you know agreed. what they say on social I, media? I, I say they call you the, the president of Tutafanya, mm -hmm. Tutatenga, <laughs> Tutafanya, Tutarudi. No, it but, is but, always but, futuristic. But, 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 but I'm here. You're saying but I'm here. We are going to have a conversation. I said within a week. I gave a timeline within a week. Yeah. So within a week, we will have agreed on where are we meeting. Are we meeting at the X space? I am ready for that X space. Are we, do we, are we agreeing on this multi-sectoral? Uh, uh, I am, I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see the suggestions that Kenyans have. I don't want to prescribe any suggestion. But when I give out a suggestion, I expect feedback. I expect people to say, Maybe this is okay, maybe this is not okay, and then we agree on our way to Mr. President, in any of them analyzing what you have actually said tonight on the issue of your advisors, your cabinet, what you're going to do, what Kenyans like to call heads that are going to roll as a result of this national shame, because that is what many people have called it, you have said, watch this space. And here there are all these other things that uh, young people are asking you about. What is that concrete thing that you're telling them tonight that I have heard you? These are the things I've heard you say since all these things started. And this is what I have done. Because you seem to have withdrawn or declined to sign this finance bill rather grudgingly, but not in good faith, having understood what people were saying. You're regretting this thing. You're saying, you guys, mutaona. Mekata, lakini mutaona. That is what, what we're hearing. Let me tell you that I will not lie to the country that putting down the finance bill is going to be easy. That, that's, that, that I'll, be, I'll, I'll, I'll not be, I'll, I'll not be uh, a leader. I have to be brutally honest. And those consequences, it will start with me to cut down the budget in my office, to remove uh, what we call austerity, to implement an austerity program that will cut down on unnecessary staff, unnecessary offices, or offices that we can, we can take down. I am ready to even engage the young people and for them to, because they, they want an engagement. I, I, do, I too want an engagement for, for us to agree so what do we do with the debt? What do we do with the following? What do we do with the following? They will tell me, uh, do this, fire so-and-so, fire so-and-so, do this. And I will tell them what is possible and what I think we could, we could do it differently. Or are you telling me that uh, I should just listen and implement without making a contribution to 
the conversation? I thought we are having a conversation. I'm, I'm just telling you what they are saying. I'm not saying anything else. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing because yes. you did say you are not in their spaces, but I am in their spaces. And, and in two weeks, Your Excellency, by now you'd have known uh, what you should do. And uh, I mean, there are basics. Which two uh, weeks? Two weeks of the riots and two weeks of the protests. It's been two weeks. It started, yeah, it started the other Monday. Yeah. So let me ask you, yeah. uh, Linus, um, the protests, uh, I, I, I finally decided that um, because we didn't communicate sufficiently to the people of Kenya the import of the finance bill, and there was so much built around it, including a lot of fake things, you know, that were not in the finance bill. Many things that were not in the finance bill were used to fight the, the finance bill. And you know, at some point, many people did not even care what was in the finance bill. Do not care. I, I think, you know, at some point, you know, as leaders, we, we, must, we must stop somewhere and say, we have a country to run. I mean, we, we cannot be reckless. We, we must at some point stop and say, what are the consequences? Because everything we do has consequences. And we must be careful as a nation to make sure that our country does not go down to the dogs. And believe me, yeah. countries you know, have, gone, have, have gone in the wrong direction. And, and, and uh, we, we must be careful. And I don't want to be the leader that took the country in the wrong direction. We must be measured, we must be careful, we must listen to the young people, we must listen to other views and be able to make a, 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 a carefully well thought out plan for the country out of where we are. Yeah, but what if the protesters are actually saying something in totality about your government, not just about the finance bill? It's not about just the finance bill, is it? Uh, Linus. As I have told you, we are a democracy. The people of Kenya can make a decision. Yeah? And, and I am perfectly, you know, uh, alive to the fact that when the people of Kenya finally, the same way they decided to elect me, when they make another decision, we will comply as the people of Kenya. You know, that's what a democracy is all about. You know, people can, can, can vote in a government, people can vote out a government for whatever uh, judgment the people have. So I want to be very clear to the people of Kenya that I will do my best to make sure that I tell the country the truth and I take the country forward. Mm. And I am committed to that. And I can see Kenya changing. If I had managed to pass this finance bill, Kenya would not be the same. We would, we would take this country to the next level. The kind of investment I have made, the kind of uh, collaboration with many friends that we have done, we would begin to see this country soaring into the future. But all is not lost. Maybe we have taken one step back. Sometimes maybe it is necessary to take one step back to be able to take many steps forward. And that is my thinking of this situation. But, but surely it must bother you, Mr. President, that two years ago you ran such a euphoric campaign with things like Hatupangwingui, and 22 months down the line, your state house is surrounded by the military. The military tanks, scary as they are, are rolling on the streets of major cities. And as we sit here today, people are saying, Ruta must go. Surely that is such a fast slide. There must be something that causes one to pause and say, how did we get here? What happened here? And one would have expected an earth-shaking statement tonight that tells the country, I get it. Something has shifted in a major way in our country. And I'm also shifting as your president who's listening. And this is the new direction things are going to take. Let me tell you, um, uh, Joe. I came into office at a difficult time. Yeah? We have a combination of coming out of COVID. We have a serious drought that hit our country. 
We had interest rates that went up everywhere. We went into a very difficult situation. What did many countries do? Many countries went and defaulted. And I don't want to mention countries because it's not right to mention. But almost eight countries in Africa went down. Many people expected Kenya to be among the eight. But believe you me, I have carefully managed the economy of Kenya. Kenya is not among the countries that have defaulted. In, if, if anything, we have running programs in Kenya. We have a whole housing program that is running. We have a whole digital program that is running. We have made changes in our education. We've hired more teachers. We've made sure that our, uh, we have a new funding model for our universities. We have supported our farmers. We have reduced the cost of living. We have done many things, even in the context of all the challenges that we have had. I am telling you, I came in and I believe I am the right person to be in this space when Kenya is in a difficult position because I believe I am the person who can sort out the challenges that faces Kenya at a point like this. But, but when the public and the protesters, the Gen Z, some of who actually formed the base of your election campaign, mm -hmm. are telling you we are disappointed, you've not delivered. Hashtag Ruto must go. What do you tell them? Let me tell them the following. Good friends, the young people of our nation, my sons and daughters who supported me to win the election. I hear you. In fact, I saw, I think it was on your headline, a gentleman from my village who was saying, the president has let us down. Many children in this village are not getting jobs locally. That is why they are going abroad. Little did he know, my good friend from my village, that the children, the 500 of his colleagues around our village are actually part of my plan on export of labor. They have actually, I intentionally supported them to leave the country because we got them jobs outside Kenya. So I am telling the young people of our nation to be patient. Our housing program is rolling. We will be hiring more architects. We will be hiring more engineers. We will be hiring more professionals to support our housing program. By in the next two years, we will have 300 maybe uh, thousand people working in that space. Be patient. We are sorting out the challenges that are facing our digital space. We are rolling out our digital space. Mm. Young guys, by the end of next year, God willing, we will have a digital hub in every ward in Kenya because we have already started that process. Every TVET in Kenya today has an ICT hub with young people monetizing their talent. I want to tell them we are full speed into manufacturing. That is why we're saying we're no longer importing clinker, we're no longer importing steel, we're no longer importing clinker, we're no longer importing uh, furniture, we are going to stop importing eggs, we're going to stop importing uh, onions and all this because we want to promote our local manufacturing mm. to be able to create jobs for them. We are no longer going to be importing diapers or sanitary parts from other countries. They are going to be manufactured be here. Mr. President. I have worked with the industries to make sure that we create opportunities for these young people. We, 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 are, we are going to work with them to we're, deal with the challenge of corruption. We are we're going, we're going to work to, with them to cut down on government largesse. I am going to make sure that we have a lean government that responds to the reality of where we are as a country. That is what I am telling my good uh, young people. Young people. There's another group of young people. Please speak to them directly. Yes. The young doctors who are in university graduating this year yes. who are going to look for internship Correct. in the next year. The young JS teachers mm. who were on strike a couple of weeks ago who are expecting to be absorbed into full permanent and pensionable contracts Correct. this year. 
the young clinical officers also who are graduating and they expect to go on internship. The other clinical officers who are hired on contract during COVID and other programs that are just contracts and contracts are coming to an end. I am all these. I am young telling the JSS them. teachers. I had factored in 18 billion shillings in this year's finance bill to be able to transfer them to permanent and pensionable. Because in my phone, so many of them have asked me, Mr. President, we came in, we had an agreement that we are going to be interns for two years, we will move to permanent and pensionable. Although I don't have the finance bill, I want to tell them, give me a bit of time, let me figure this out, how we are going to do it without the finance bill. We had also put three billion shillings yeah for the doctors so that we can be able to sort them out, especially the intern doctors and those who we intended to hire to, uh, under our UHC program. I had put 10 billion shillings on the UHC program under the finance bill. That is now not in the equation. I have to figure out, let them just give me a little, a little, a little time. I'm going to figure it out again because I know and I feel and I made a commitment to them that we will do this. So even in the absence of the finance bill, and even as we cut down on expenditure on many other areas, it is still my commitment that we will see what to do with them so that the job they are doing in teaching our children, in treating our people, do not go to waste. Mr. Mr. President, we, we, we're almost winding down this, but have you noticed that those young people, they actually have worked out the things that they believe you can take out and still be able to do the important things? Because you seem to have this elaborate plan and I'm wondering where their views will fit in because you seem to have uh, this all worked out, but they probably don't want all those things. That is they, why. They have figured out. That is why, yeah. you know, part of what I told you, Joe, is communicating, you know? And I hope this time round, I find a medium where I can engage, you know? And I am ready to go to this X place to engage with them. And I want to tell them, this is my plan, okay? Tell me how I can make this better. Tell me this is not good enough, you know? Change this, because I have seen some of the demands they have made. They have said that uh, don't hire CASs, and I agree with them. They have said, remove the office of the first lady, the second, the spouse of the, uh, the second lady and all that, and I have agreed with them. They have said a couple of things that we already are in agreement. They have, of course, said some of the things, abolish the office of uh, uh, women rep. I've seen they have also said we should reduce the salaries of MPs to 200,000 or something. Some of those things are things that are not in my power. Those are the things that we need to do a whole of society, a whole of nation approach, so that if we are bringing down salaries from 1.1 trillion to 700 billion, that is something I am willing and I am ready to start with my own salary, going down to salaries of others so yeah. that we can all live within our means. Your Excellency, we are now going to our final questions. And uh, my final question will uh, be about the protest and the deployment of KDF, uh, which you did um, a few days ago. Now, the Gen Z millennials and the online um, Kenyans that are organized this, organizing these protests are promising to be back on the streets on, on Tuesday. What should we expect on Tuesday when protesters, peaceful as they have, some of them have been, turn up on the streets of Nairobi? Do we expect them to be chased away by the Kenya Defense Forces? First, the Kenyan Defense Forces will not be on the street. They only come as a last resort. If the demonstrations will be peaceful, I promise you, the police will be there to protect the demonstrators. But the police will also be there to make sure that the criminals, the fellows who come to burn offices, the fellows who come to loot property, will also be dealt with. That is my commitment. We must all operate within the law. 
and uh, that is what it is. My final question is on the elephant in the room, the elephant in our budget, public debt. Candidate William Ruto responded to a question during the debate, and he said he's going to commission an audit of the public debt. President William Ruto last year responded to the same question and said it's important for us to audit our public debt. Today's question is when? Public debt is actually a public document where we are as a country. The 10 point something trillion of our debt is in the public domain. But I am prepared for us to put in forensic experts as part of this exercise so that we can all appreciate, yes, this is what we owe, and then agree how do we pay, how do we deal with it. In fact, I was in Korea. And in fact, Korea, when they had a problem of debt, the whole nation came together. And people contributed gold. Others contributed many things because they wanted to pay their national debt. Maybe we will need that conversation once we are all clear that this is public debt. My but question, Mr. President, is when? As soon as we finish this conversation, once we have agreed that this is the way we are going, I will institute the necessary steps to make sure that that debt is audited and it is made public for Kenyans to know this is the public debt. And I'm sure it will not take a month for us to be able to know is this, what is Kenya's public debt? And, and then we can take it up from there and go forward. Mr. President, my final question is about your cabinet. Given the things that have happened, given the questions that have been raised about fertilizer, about edible oils, about sugar and all of that, tonight, can you look Kenyans in the eye and tell them you have full confidence in the cabinet that is currently helping you to run the country? The cabinet that I have maybe could have done better. That's not the question, Mr. President. Maybe could have done better. I'm answering your question. Okay. Yeah. Maybe, unless you have a better answer. Allow, allow me to answer. No, I just thought my question was no, specific, but you can go No, that's what ahead. I'm saying. So uh, maybe my cabinet would have done better, right? And I am going to do a soul searching on how we need to move forward. All right, thank you very much, Mr. President, for your time. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is where we end this conversation with the President tonight. My colleagues have been Lena Skaikai from Citizen TV, Royal Media Services, and Eric Latif representing KTN, KTN News from the Standard Media Group. And my name is Joe Ageo from NTV. Do have a lovely evening.